He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Kia ora and welcome to the Kim Hill Collection. This interview from 2006 answers the question, what happens when you get three really world-class New Zealanders, masters of their respective arts, pop them into a room together for 45 minutes and hit the record button? It's just as much fun as it sounds. And we do hope you enjoy it. Their local boys made good, both quintessential Kiwi blokes, laconic, laid back, modest and incredibly attractive. Sam Neill and John Clark, you may have seen their latest collaboration on the TV adaptations of Australian writer Shane Maloney's Murray Whelan stories for the small screen. Last week, it was Stiff, directed by John Clark, with an appearance by Sam Neill as a shifty big businessman. Tonight, it's The Brush Off, directed by Sam Neill with an appearance by John Clark, for the most part in a penny. This is the product of Hunt Away Films, a venture by Neil and Clark and Jay Cassell's producer, aimed at telling New Zealand and Australian stories. Perfect Strangers, the Gailene Preston movie, was the company's first project, I think. And the Murray Whelan novels were something else again. Sam Neill and John Clark join me now. Good morning. Good morning, Kim. Good morning. What time is it there, John? 1974. You could be <laughs> You could be here if you weren't so afraid of flying, you know. Sitting you in the here. studio with Sam himself. I flew in here. <laughs> you did fly in from the outer suburbs of Melbourne. Mm. How is Melbourne? It's looking good on stiff and the brush off. Uh, yeah, well it's uh, well it's a it are two different Melbournes in those films actually. One of them's a bit grimy and one of them's a bit sort of edgy and uh, has a fashion element. There's not much of a fashion element in the first one, and no. it's to do with the, proje- the, the trajectory ah. of Mr Whelan. Ah, oh, I thought it had something to do with the fact that Sam might know a bit more fashion than you do. <laughs> how dare you? <laughs> I'm just going to continue. I'm leaving. No, <laughs> well, you stay there. Sam, how did you choose who was going to direct which? Because, as John said, you know, Stiff is the grimy, seamy, underworldish bit of Melbourne, and the brush-off has got that arty-farty world going on with a bit of Hollywood thrown in, perhaps. Yes, well, the brush-off is, is about the art world, uh, and in my more pretentious moments, I, I pretend to know something about art. I don't, of course, but I put my hand up for that, and John passed me the ball, and I, I ran as fast as I could for the for the try line. I was a bit slow on the brush off, which I should tell people is screening tonight. I saw it on the DVD. I saw, I noticed one mm, clever reference to Colin McCann with a bit of graffiti on the wall, and then Mm. I wondered what else I was missing. Are there lots of little clues? Yes, thank you for noticing that. Rats. That's not the only one there. (laughs) No, it it is absolutely riddled with uh, references to other things. I'll have to watch it again. Um, We'll we'll talk more about the Shane Maloney novels in a minute. John Clark, when did you first meet Sam Neill? I'll ask him the same question, of course, but what's your recall? Um, I, my recall is that we met near the latter end of the, um, shall we say, university careers of both of us. What are we talking and, about, 70s? Uh, yeah, yes. early 70s. Um, and uh, we were both, in one way or another, interested in the performing arts and um, and the arts generally. And as opposed so, to the unperforming arts, you mean? Well, as to, well, neither of us you'll note as a painter or... Um, Anything like that. I think, well, I mean, yes. Sam, Sam was in some plays. Um, I notably remember The Back Eye. Do you remember that, Sam? No. <laughs> um, which was in Wellington. And I sort of wasn't in plays but was interested in a different sort of performance. But there, there were a, a, there was only a relatively small community who were interested in those things and there wasn't much of an opportunity to do it. So inevitably, um, you know, we met... Um, you, you met all of the other people who were interested. There were probably seven of us in the universe. And um, uh, in our case, we uh, we got on and we sort of started talking and we've met each other in various places since. And I think that we were just beating a tactical withdrawal from university and trying to work out how you do the performance thing and eat. You weren't both at the same university, were you? No, we had the system outflanked. All right. <laughs> So no, we were. We were I, I, it was. I was on my fifth year of a BA, <laughs> the longest BA in in, in history, and um, so I had one unit to go at Victoria University, and that's when I spotted a hirsute young man across a crowded, smoky room. It was John Clark, and he. Uh, I'm eternally grateful to John because 
I did no work that year at all. I was doing philosophy one in order to complete this tatty degree. And, of course, I never went to lectures. And I went to do things like plays at downstage and so on. So um, come exam time, I realized uh, I knew nothing about anything at all. And I was sweating and pale in the cafeteria one night, and John sat down beside me and said, what's the matter? And I said, I've got an exam tomorrow, and I know nothing. He said, no worries. Come to the library. I will give you two hours tuition in um, logic, and, <laughs> and uh, um, you'll be fine. And he did that and got me through. I scraped through with a C- minus or something, but a scrape through is better than nothing at all. So I owe my distinguished academic career very much to John. Good Lord. Do you remember that, John? Uh, yeah, it's Sam's uh, um I retired from teaching at that point. I thought a hundred percent record wasn't bad. I'll go home now. So, in 1973, you uh, became uh, impinged upon our conscience with Fred Dagg, of course. Mm. And do you remember that, Sam? I do indeed, of course. I, I, I think the moment when John morphed into Fred Dagg. Well, there were early sort of incarnations of, of Dagger. Uh, I'm not sure if he was called John. Uh, mm. John, was he called Fred Dagger at that point? No, but there were early, some, early versions right, of him in, 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 in review at Downstage. Mm. Yeah, that's right. It was always sort of a floating possibility. It needed a name when it went on television because, of course, television is of the view that unless you have a name at the bottom of the screen, you aren't anything. So well, that's probably possibly, true. can't be listening to somebody without knowing... You know which office they fit in. When you so. mentioned the back eye, John, Sam mm. chortled away, and I let it pass. But now I want to know more about it. Well, uh, Sam was in in plays, and and um, in uh, plays, the only one, yeah, he yeah. was in he was a dramatic actor. You see. <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> yes. afford to be because if I'm going to tr- make a living out of waiting for somebody to ring me and ask me to play Hamlet, I'm going to get, you know, relative. I'm going to lose a fair bit of weight. Um, so I had to, uh, so I was writing the things that I was performing. Sam wanted to be a more serious sort of performer and it's a very difficult thing to do because you do have to wait for people to ask you to be in plays. And, and I remember when, uh, for some reason or other, I remember you were in the back eye at one point, Sam, and I can't remember too many other plays that were on in Wellington at that mm. time, but I do remember that, mm. um, was, partly was, because I didn't know anything about Euripides and I had to... I had to go. What is this? You know, mm. it was it was the f- it was um, not the first, but certainly not the last of a series of indignities that I've had in my, in my career, in which it, it's a play in which Pentheus is um, is uh, 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 put into a, a series of compromising positions with uh, a number of young women and so on, and um, uh, by Dionysus and ends up in drag. Mm. Now, the sight of me in drag is not a pleasant one and not one I would care to repeat, but um, that's that's the life of an actor. You expect to be humiliated from time to time. and uh, You seem to have held fairly firmly on to your own sexuality since then, Sam. Mm, yeah, well, it's a tenuous grip. So but to speak. It's, yeah, it's, I'm still holding on, I think. I was, yeah. Your first part, was it not, at uh, Midsummer Night's Dream in Nyamash Theatre? Uh, pr- well, probably the first, yeah. Well, I'm not sure about the first, but it was... Um, uh, uh, probably the first serious stab at some serious theatre, yeah. Who were you in The Midsummer Night's Dream? Mm, good question. Theseus, I think. Oh, were you? Dull part. Yeah? You would mm. rather have been Titania at that stage in your life, perhaps. Bottom. <laughs> so, who first read Shane Maloney and said, oh, my Lord, we've got to do that? Is that how it came to pass? Um, sort of. Shane... Shane um, is a... Uh, I've known Shane for a long time and I've actually watched him become a novelist. He's, I've watched him have various jobs and he's a very clever fellow and he eventually thought, well, maybe I'll become a novelist. What was he before he was a novelist? When I first met him, he was the um, publicity manager for a radio station. He had had a dispute with management and had nailed himself in his office. Mm. Um, now, as publicity <laughs> goes, this is not in the Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he was a very slight misfit in some of these more conventional roles, but he observed that there is, um, if you're going to write um, books or something, it's quite a good idea to work out what the form is, and he chose the detective novel. Um, now, Murray Whelan isn't really a detective. Not at all. A, no, but there's a genre, a sort of crime, I suppose. He's a sort of anti-detective, isn't he? Because he falls into things yeah, and exactly. makes a mess of them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he's um, he's possibly goes to work because his domestic life is so appalling 
and he goes home when his work is worse than his domestic life. Mm. Um, so he seeks relief. Um, but anyway, Shane wrote the first couple of novels somewhat tentatively, and he's now an extremely successful novelist. And I've spoken to him a bit about the genre, the crime genre, or whatever we might call it, because it's used by a number of writers in various parts of the world. And it's quite an interesting genre in which the central character can be imagined in various different ways. There are, you know, there used to be these tough guy novels that were written by Dash Hammett and people in Chicago where, you know, they were, blokes were very, you know, I came into the room, poured myself two fingers of rye and threw myself on the couch sort of stuff. The day wasn't good, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, then there was a then there was a, a period uh, when which Raymond Chandler famously somebody once said he got hold of the Who Done It and turned it into a Who Did It because he was literate and he could write really well and he reimagined the whole genre on the west coast of the United States so it's all Californian buildings and bright sunlight and flash cars and and women with no apparent means of support. Um, and Shane's one, Shane's variation on this, it could be argued, is this down-at-heel Labour Party middle-range apparatchik living in Melbourne. And I've watched those books emerge and I've thought before, you know, they make good television because they're character-intensive um, and all, you, all that needs to happen really is that the intimacy between the reader and the writer needs to be turned into an intimacy between the lead character and the viewer. Mm. Um, How do you do that? Must be the hardest part because you haven't got that interior voice that you no, do well, when you're reading. That's a good question. But in fact, some people solve this by having a voiceover, and we toyed with that. We talked about that early. But you but couldn't afford you, one, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> it does. It does. It, it means that it uh, it interrupts momentum a bit sometimes. Mm. And if we could do it without that, if we could do it as as mainstream drama to look at with the character variation, it was always going to be capable of moving faster and it needs to move quite quickly. We don't want it to... It wasn't going to be... These weren't going to be a series. If they'd been a series, you might have left the voiceover in. Ah, well, we'll talk about that in a moment. Why not series? Um, Sam, a frustrated director? You've directed documentaries, of course, because you used to be with the National Film mm. Unit. Mm. Is this the first fiction? Thing? Yes, first fiction, um, and uh, I must say it was a very compelling thing to do. I absolutely loved it. I was exhausted at the end of it, but it was it was great fun. The producer Jay Castle says that you had such a good time you shouldn't have been paid. I was hardly paid. No. But it was, it <laughs> yes. was national. You were. What was hard about it? Um, well, living and breathing this whole thing for I don't know what was it five months or something. I hardly slept and, you know, m my dreams were about Shane Maloney and John Clark and David Wenham and... and, uh, and so when you're acting, mm. you can go home and leave all the hard decisions to someone else. Is that, well, is that can, what you're saying? Yeah, and you go off and do the crossword and, and, um, and gossip with um, grips and things like that. But when you're directing, every waking moment is devoted to what you're doing and every decision has to go through you. I've got a whole new respect for directors now. That yeah. I, I always respected directors, but I, I respect them immensely now. Uh, is acting not hard for you? Look, it depends what you mean by hard. I mean, I think it's a very difficult thing to, to act well. But um, as, it's not exactly brain surgery, nor is it road mending. You know, it's, it, it's, it, you don't, it's hard to work up a sweat. Do you see what I mean? So. I think that you're trying to be self-effacing without <laughs> undermining the profession of actor simultaneously, which is a particularly hard thing to do. Tell me <laughs> about the scene in The Brush Off, which, as I've said, you directed, mm. where um, Murray Whelan ends up diving into this inflatable woman. Yes, I think this is a first in Antipodean uh, <laughs> cinema. It's disgusting. That a, a man is is blown out of a fuse box and explodes a third of a woman. <laughs> and, uh, in the book, Something though, of a milestone. In the book, he becomes Jonah inside the whale, doesn't he? You had yes, to change he, that. He falls off a ladder into a whale and comes out its rear end. Yeah. Uh, he's, Shane had to get him out of the way for half an hour for the purposes of his plot. So he put him into a basement which is full of floats from the Moomba Festival. We couldn't find floats from the Moomba Festival. 
uh, nor did we have enough money to buy to to build a whale. So uh, Chris, the designer, thought about inflatable things, and I thought it would be wonderful to explode an inflatable thing because you could then have the longest fart in the world. I I find farts very funny. I'm not yes. sure about you. And um, so I th that was all built around. That I wasn't agreeing with him then, John. I just want to make it clear. <laughs> I was just trying to encourage him to continue with the story. It wasn't a commitment on my part to finding facts no, funny. No, no, so, that, I inferred that. Thank you. How, did we ex how could we explode? And I, I insisted that it, that it be a 30-foot woman. We found one from a bra shop or something. It was at the, and they blow them up in the suburbs of Melbourne to advertise things, tyres and bras. <laughs> and stuff bras, like perhaps. So we found a 30-foot woman. How to explode it? John had the idea of a short ladder because we need to get them into a fuse box. Chris thought we should explode them out of a fuse box. So John had this wonderful idea of a ladder that's not quite high enough so that Murray could see out the window to call for help. So, that's, so he, puts the, he, he gets himself on, on the top of the fuse box, lifts the ladder up in a uh, Buster Keaton-esque manner. The, the ladder implodes into the fuse box, and thereby he explodes out of there and explodes with a 30-foot woman. Yeah. I'm very proud of this sequence. Yeah. How many it's takes did you... entirely puerile. How many takes did you do? Um, we, we, well, we, we had to do the whole thing in two days. Everything from the studio down, explode the woman, back up to the studio, the, the villainess turns up. You know, we were strapped for time, so we were really, really motoring those two days. So how many inflatable women did you have to explode? I think we just got one go. Really? One go at everything. Really? Yeah. Well, that was extraordinarily good then. And I particularly liked, as you say, that enunciation scene at the end of it, with the shaft of light coming down. The shaft of light, yeah. yes. <laughs> it's all very arty, isn't it, John? Uh, Whereas, John, yes. you got stiff, you know, which yeah. is the underworld of Melbourne politics. Yes, and it's poor, it's... poor Murray, in the shape of... David Wenham, is he married? And what's his phone number? <laughs> um, coping with his he house, very well of you, his yeah. household disasters, <laughs> which is strangely and compellingly attractive, I have to tell you. Household disasters and the poor bloke having to deal with them on his own. Yes, he's a nice guy, isn't he? Yeah, he's good. And and of course, um, uh, if you're shooting a movie-length uh, uh, production in twenty days, you can't have someone in the lead who isn't a bit of a genius, because if you get a take that's good, you need to have the brains to go, yep, that's done, let's go, quickly, oh. because if you, ca you just cannot slow down. And David is a wonderful, like a lot of um, good actors, Sam's like this himself, um, uh, is a very good judge of, of his own performance. So it's possible, for example, to be happy with a performance where you actually make a mistake, but you do it in character. You should pick the phone up on line three and you forget about it and you pick it up at the end of the scene. Technically, that'll be wrong, but if no one's going to notice, let's go, you know. Yeah. So it was just exhilarating. I'd never met David before. I'd admired his work. Because um, he was in Lord of the Rings, of course, wasn't he? He was. He was... Um, Thorobin. Falafel. Mm. Yes. Falafel. That's right. Um, He's pretty much one of us. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> anyway, we had, a, we had a very big time. But, if, yes, they are very different because Stiff is obviously a very much grimier story and it's earlier in the, in the Murray oeuvre, so he hasn't quite risen to the rank of um, Ministerial Secretary yet. Mm. Shane Maloney in his website says that there's, there's not going to be another one because... The oh, I know the second, the second Murray Whelan telly movie went to air. David Wenham's impersonation of Murray was once again a delight. Bloody blah, blah, blah. With luck, they will all rush out now, the viewers, and buy the book. Future Murray Whelan telly movies don't hold your breath. In the view of the high ratings, which are contrary to network policy, <laughs> Channel Seven <laughs> has decided not to proceed with the planned series. Instead, it plans a reality series based on a group of celebrity chefs marooned in a backyard makeover with nothing to eat but Pauline Nansen. <laughs> 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 now, joking aside, are there going to be any more? Well, I'd, I think sh I'm, I'm with Shane, really. Yeah. Um, it sounds a bit surreal, but w when you win the ratings, um, that doesn't mean that the channel notices. One of, one of the Did you win the ratings, let's be clear? Yeah. Yeah, we, we we won the ratings, and and in fact it was on on a Sunday night, and um, Channel Seven. What time is a matter of interest? Eight thir. See, they're putting it on here after ten. Did yes, you know that? Well, uh, yes, most people have the noddies by then. I'm a bit worried about mm. that.
we're we're obviously of a more sensitive disposition than you Australians. Yeah, that's possibly it. Yeah. Mm. I noticed the weather for the Chathams hasn't changed since I left either. No. <laughs> um, no. The uh, <laughs> but uh, the uh, I don't look if if you, if the if if we'd walked in the door and I were running a TV station, I'd have commissioned this as a series, not two telly movies. Well, because... I assume so. Because yeah, you'd you have might... you know the economics of scale then. That's wouldn't right. You? And you'd have you'd have David Wenham on your channel seven times rather than once. Oh, and you'd have, I think you should have him reading the news. Yeah, well, he's yeah he he is fantastic. And in fact, David is one of the most successful performers in Australian television history. He was in a, a program called Sea Change, which, well, the whole country just fell in love with him. That it was, was a lovely show. Of, mm. Yeah, and very so, much the same tone, wasn't it? You know that kind of similar laconic Aussie. Yeah, thing that's right. Going on. Well, of course. Um, one of the things that happened when we did this show was that Channel 7, which is a mainstream commercial station, won the ratings with it, but not because their own audience watched it. David's audience went to Channel 7 to watch it. Ah. And so Channel 7 are uh, almost miffed that this is not, I can't do this the rest of the time. This is not their core business. Because all these mystery. losers and outsiders have been tuning yeah, in. Yeah, the oh, ratings okay. went up. What's going on? <laughs> Get me who was... Who did that? <laughs> well... Stand up, the boy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so are you saying that there won't be any more or there will be some more? What are you saying? I, I, Why I don't think, you do them over here? I think that Channel 7 aren't going to make any more, but I think that they are a terrific thing. And I, it is a wonderful genre for television. Mm the crime genre because you get story and you get character and you get the you know the the variation in the character which is linguistic or cultural or whatever it is and Shane's is a very interesting one um uh you, you get them all why did you not have money like why did sam have to only have a woman he could blow up once instead of a whale <laughs> Uh, we had well, enough money. <laughs> we had enough. The, well just the, why the, did you it, only have one camera i suppose that's <laughs> art is it well, I don't know. That's uh, Sa Sam's. Um, we, we did. We really, li literally, did have to make these feature-length things in twenty days. Well, normally on Sam's job, on after twenty days, you're, you know, you, you, you're um, working out the decor in your caravan. Yeah, exactly. And what you want in your fridge. <laughs> yeah. And your Winnie Bago. That's right. So why did you only have one camera? There's a long um, silence here. Does nobody know the answer to this question? Well, no, I, I think we... Uh, well, occasionally, we have ways of finding out, you know. Occasionally we did have two cameras, but I don't. I think Sam's right on that big shoot. It's um, you, If you light it... I might say the guy who designed this, Chris oh. Kennedy, won every award that wasn't nailed down, mm. um, and rightly so. He's a fantastic designer. But one of the things that happens when you design something like that and light it is that... Um, if it's lit from a particular position, that's really where you better shoot it from. If you shoot it, you know, if you've got a camera running from the other side, the lighting mightn't work. And sometimes so I don't know quite how they figured it out. I don't understand film grammar really. That's why I hang around with Sam. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it's actually better to to shoot things fast. And uh, some some of these big films you see in the movies, the reason they're so dull is because they've taken 150 days to shoot the damn things. You know, people are just bored out of their minds. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. 20 days, you're running. So you th you have the uh, advantages of theatre in some peculiar way when you're doing it fast, do you, Sam? No, I think you're just you're just running on adrenaline, and mm. and uh, and that's very very that's very very uh, kind of energising. Mm -mm. Whose um, genius was it that cast um, Agnello Agnello Angelo Agnelli? I'm afraid that's the John Clark genius. That was genius, John. Well, uh, um, I'd done a film with Mick Malloy um, called Crackerjack, and Mick very often plays himself, a somewhat blousy man of uncertain years. And um, he, <laughs> but he's a good actor. You know, yes. you can't be a good comic performer in a, a lot of these areas without actually being fundamentally a pretty good actor. So I thought, well, that might appeal. And he's, he, he. Um, as he says himself, looks a bit like a Lebanese grocer, and he um, was quite happy to do this. And we put him in a suit, we made him shave his beard off. His mother actually rang me and said, how did you do that? So we cleaned him up something tragic. So To make him was, into the Minister of Arts and yeah. Water. But he's still got that slight, <laughs> that slight rough diamond swagger, yeah. um, which uh, he's pretty good at. So, um, no, that was rather... We were a bit lucky that could have... Um, 
that could have been a bigger risk than it was. But Mick's very, very, very smart, and he grabbed it with both hands, I have to say. He was great. I... There's actually a scene in Stiff w between David and Sam and Mick, which is one of the neatest things I've yes. ever seen. It's yes, a... yes. They yeah. are, they're all absolutely deadly. It's like well, that's can... why I asked you about the Only One camera, which you've been a bit evasive about, because mm. on the extra, well, the extra DVD thingy, you know, the yeah. bits that you find out, you anatomise that scene and, and, and sh show us how it's done using oh, the Only right. One camera. Oh, that's right. Yes, we do, don't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah, well, And it's very clever. Reason, yeah. Well, one of the reasons I did that with that particular scene is that when we were shooting it, the, the three actors all are so good at knowing, you know, what their strengths are and how best to do this that it was really pretty delicious to watch them do it. There's no point in saying, um, you know, can we do that again slightly faster or something because these are people who know what they're doing. Mm. And the reason I was slow about the camera is I can't remember... I wasn't there the day Sam shot the exploding thing, so I can't remember how that was. But we had two cameras one night on stiff when we had to drop a car in a river. Um and we were only going to do it once, so we had two cameras running that night. And, in fact, I, I let the cameras roll while they pull... By law, when you drop a car in a river, you have to pull it out again. So we, <laughs> so we went and the, the nice policeman came down and showed us where the river was and explained what up meant and stuff like that. And um, we then got this car back out of the river, still with its headlights on and um, still, you know, looking like a little noddy car. Yes. Its heart was still in it. Um, anyway, um, when they got it out, they found seven others <laughs> down there. <laughs> really? So we were there for some time. Uh, and the police said, well, while we've got the crane here, can we... Because these other cars you know, <laughs> are wanted for questioning over a range of issues involving the ex import-export crane. Oh, Lord, I hope you didn't find anybody in any of them. No, no, no. that's right. I had my heart in my yeah, mouth yeah, from yeah, it, yeah. but no. What I need to know, what better thing did you have to do, John, than to watch David Wenham being ejaculated into an inflatable woman. Yes, no, well, as I say, that was... A, that was um, I wasn't there that day. I know. I Why weren't you there? How could you not have been there? Oh, I would well, have sold no. tickets. Oh, oh no, I, I was doing something else. I, I know that. I work for a living. I, this business of, hurt, of hurling Hollywood lead actors into inflatable women is some private matter of Sam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see a lot of stuff's being worked out here in a Viennese sense, as you might say, John. That's right, yeah. yes. Huh. Um... Yes, so, please don't read anything Freudian into any no, of this at all. We already have. It's too late. <laughs> all right. If 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 Channel Seven is out of it, mm. who is going to make them or screen them or like? When's the next one? What's happening with you? Well, well, my view of the television culture in Australia is that the natural home for these would be the ABC, but the ABC has um, had in real terms, some pretty severe budgetary restrictions put on it. And what we needed to do um, when we shot these films, and the, one of the reasons that they're very uh, short uh, shooting schedules is that we could only get David for a certain period. Um, and because we could only get David for that period, we were shooting two of them in a, a relatively short period, and that meant that whoever paid for them needed to basically pay for two in one short period and the ABC having committed most of its drama budget for that year wasn't in a position to do them both in the same financial year mm. so um, that's they wanted to do it but they physically couldn't engineer it so sadly you know it, if they'd been there they might have had that's the audience that went and watched them on Channel 7 mm. I mean the lights went out at the ABC the night they went to air <laughs> um, nobody home no appearance your worship so, Sam, would you like to carry on directing? I mean, is this, you know, a plan for the future? Uh, I'd certainly like to do another Murray Whelan. Uh, and uh, I must say, I really enjoyed so many aspects of this, not the least of them being working with a lot of old friends and, and you know, getting, getting to direct John uh, <laughs> in, a, in, 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 in a rather strict and uh, Eastern... Eastern European kind of way that was a pleasure in itself. But can I, I, one director? Uh, yeah, yes, very, very much so. He's, yeah. he's very, very open and amenable to. Uh, he'll do anything. Yeah. Um, but I called in a lot of favours from lots of old friends. Um, so you know, Bruce Spencer's in it, and he's another New Zealander actually. And um, uh, there's all sorts of people here that I've known for many, many years, and I, I love working with actors. It was really good. Well, fun. that's the way you describe it in that 
self-effacing way that you've mastered is that <laughs> is that people went to work with John because John is like a magnet and people mm. went to work with you because you called in favors in other words he had the charm and you had the blackmail and the bribery that's it yeah yeah, yeah. Is that's that right. how it seemed to you yeah, John I think so. yeah no i think that's a little disingenuous ah. i think your psychological reading of this is very accurate yes i think a lot of people um well sam hadn't done sam hadn't directed anything quite like this um and everyone who he asked obviously went yes he did i don't think he finished the sentence mm. would you yes mm. so um <laughs> i don't think there was too much of it um and I'll they said who, who wrote it and he said john clark and i said well look we'll do it anyway sam we'll do it for you <laughs> i had oh god i um i haven't read stiff yeah so i don't know whether in Stiff there is that guy with the dodgy tattoo, you know, there he is. wanted, is that? Yep. That's yeah, there brilliant. Is. It is a good idea, isn't it? He won't leave the office, he never leaves. I should tell people, because it doesn't spoil very much, that he's in the electoral office of Angelo Agnelli complaining that he's got this stupid tattoo and his woman's kicked him out because he wanted Gail with a heart <laughs> surrounding it and the tattoo is spelt it G-A-O-L. Yeah. <laughs> so he spends the entire program in the office answering the phones. Yeah. And he is a stunning piece of acting. He's very good, and Murray is so hopeless at his job that he cannot deal with the fact that this bloke says, well, I'm not leaving, mate, until I get some satisfaction on this matter. So every time he comes in, he's but, there, yeah, inveigling so, himself into Trisha's good graces. And doing actually quite useful work around the place and ultimately signing a farewell card for someone who's yes, leaving the office. Yes, I know. It's brilliant. You <laughs> he's see, a very good, he's another good actor, that guy. He's a very well-known comedian. comic. But, mm. yeah. but you, Sam, you must have had some say in how the characters were developed in Stiff because, in a way, you had the hard job of picking them up and developing for the brush-off. Stiff was the establishment one. Mm. Uh, well, there's only uh, Trish, uh, Agnelli and Murray, really. I think that's about mm. it, isn't it, that, that carry the on? And um, Red. Yeah, and, and the and Sun. The sun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, um, they were well established by the time I came. Um, uh, uh, now um, he's good too, Red, isn't he? Cute. He's very good. Yeah, yeah. Really good. He's a very good. But Deborah, we'd worked with before, so we knew exactly what she was going to do. She yeah, plays, Deb you know, the backbone of the office. Yeah, that's yeah. right, yeah. Deborah Kennedy. Yeah. Sam and I did a film in the, just shortly after the war called Death in Brunswick. Yes. And um, she was in that. So when Sam and I did speak, and, and we did speak before casting the first one <laughs> in terms of the characters and things, and we both agreed that um, we, should, we should get her to do that role. And si similarly, the designer uh, was the same designer on Death in Brunswick, the, one, the, the, the cinematographer who shot the brush off, shot mm. Death in Brunswick, um, and so on. So, you know... We, we we did have we went in there with some certainties. Did we you never argue that. about anything? I mean, you all you know terribly decent and polite and modest and all the rest of it. But did you never argue about anything? We had a difference of opinion about the moustache on Agnelli. So you notice That's in right. one film there is no moustache, <laughs> and the other one there is a moustache. That was a That's bitter right. bitter disagreement. So is yes, that, that the way was. you compromised? Um, yeah, we're just uh, just we refuse to agree on it, and so mm. in we one focused Scotland, our dislike for one another on the moustache. <laughs> I'm trying to I remember where the moustache is. Has he got a moustache in the brush off? Yes, yes he has. All right. Yeah. So obviously, Sam, you wanted the moustache. I like the moustache. And why yeah. didn't you like the moustache, John? We need to get to the bottom. Well, of his, his, I was with his mother was behind me, and she was saying, "Make him take it off. <laughs> Make him just bad for the character. His character wouldn't do that. His character wouldn't grow a moustache, uh. John." I, said, I think in hindsight John was right, but I, don't tell him that. No, I won't. No, I, I just wanted to um, have Mick look as different as possible from the way that he'd been seen before, and I also thought that uh, it, it was ministerial. And in it's, I mean, Sam's judgment was reasonable um, in a completely different context because a lot of the other people in his film were rather fashionable. Hardly anyone in my film had shaved. Hmm. So, so the contexts were completely di uh, different, and that was that's a legitimate difference. Mm. I, it wasn't really a kind of, uh, I think you're wrong, no, no, you know. I think there were um, different considerations. What about Murray himself? Was he, um, Murray, Shane, was he happy with the, uh, with the way you both adapted his books? Well, he pretends to be. He, he was very nice about it. <laughs> um, he didn't hit either of us. No. Um, I think um, 
I think it's also if you're a writer. He looks like Barry Humphreys, doesn't he? Yeah, Shane. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, he's. Um, That's very and odd. Shane's, Shane's a very. Um, Shane's a pretty savvy kind of bloke, and and I think that. Uh, uh, and he, the books go pretty well. The books are big in Europe. They sell in the States. Um, that's and also, the other thing about this genre. It's just international. Mm. Also, um, he makes an appearance in The Brush Off. I put him in there as, as a sort of... Oh, um, that's right. As, as a flunky. And oh, really, all is authors want to be movie stars. Hitchcockian. And, yeah, and, and, and if you put them in your movie, they're happy. You can do whatever you like. Where is he? He's in the sequences the where the... Mm. He's in the sequences where the painting is revealed at the art gallery mm. oh. and there's a lot of polite sort of clapping and yeah his his Agnelli's off cider I think okay he will like that he might get mm. a taste for thespianism is that the first one he's done yes, yes I, it I'm is. sure he wants to do more here. I'm sure yeah try and keep him out it's one of the mm. reasons we're not making any more yeah <laughs> how um did you manage to get any product placement Sam you know two paddocks being quaffed Oh, God, you know, I'm shameless, but not that shameless. Oh, well, I thought that was the <laughs> foolish thing. You could have done yourself some good there. I should have, yeah. All those arty types, quaffing wine and no, opening. No, my conscience got the better of me on that. that so are there any in-jokes that we need, any more in-jokes that we need to look out for tonight in the brush-off? Mm. Uh, can you think of any, John? I, there's no. Cer there's certainly... Um, uh, uh, when An Agnelli meets... Um, uh, an Asian woman, he says, um, and where are you from in this greasy way? And uh, she says, I'm from Melbourne. And uh, that comes actually from, um, it's a question that's asked many times of my family. Yes, yes. Where are you from? I'm from New Zealand. Yeah. <laughs> that's mm. right. That's yeah. right. That was a very good line, actually. And it was, it was done well because it's kind of off screen and <laughs> you could hear it disappearing into the background. It's cool. Yes, I, have a, I have a friend who has a Chinese background and I was with him one day and somebody said, where are you from? And he said, I'm from Melbourne. And somebody said, yeah, but before that, <laughs> where were you from? Sydney. And he said, Sydney. <laughs> he said, I don't know what I, what I mean. is like, well, your grandparents, where were they from? He said, Adelaide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's he the... <laughs> That's the sense you get of Melbourne in both of them, actually, yeah. more so in Stiff, that it's a hugely multicultural melting pot, everybody rubbing along. Yeah. And, of course, we are too, and I think we should, we, should, we should make mention of a couple of films that I saw this week. Yeah, I know you want to do this. Yeah, number two, beautiful film, and Sione's Wedding, which... And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I cannot tell you how relieved I am about these films and how happy I was to see them relieved well you know 10 years ago i coined the phrase become a bit of a cliche now actually it's cinema of unease and it occurred to me this morning <laughs> and i was thinking of i was thinking damn of, you <laughs> i was thinking of these two films and i thought this is cinema at ease and i think what these films do and i strongly recommend that every new zealander should see both these films they're fabulous is is that they are uh, you know films are good barometers of a cultural uh, of of a cultural climate, and it occurred to me that this these films are about a country that's so much more at ease with itself, that's so much more comfortable with its uh, with itself. So I'm very very encouraged and excited by this. Sam Neill and John Clark are with me talking about their collaboration on the Shay Maloney novels. We played that because Sam was raving about number two in that modest and self-effacing fashion he has. <laughs> and, John, you now have an opportunity to be modest and self-effacing and rave about something that has nothing to do with you. Think about it. Time's mm. up. What would that be? Something that's got nothing to do with me? Yeah. Well, I was just thinking, listening to that music, that um, I remember fondly um, Front Lawn, which uh, I think Don and Harry Sinclair and... Jennifer Ward, Layla, and other but I remember seeing them years ago. They were absolutely fantastic. They were a blast, weren't they? Nobody had yeah. ever done anything like that before. Yeah, that's right. You um, have, I have an email here, actually, John, telling me that you were hiding your dramatic acting pedigree. And in 1973, mm. while Sam was cavorting in The Midsummer Night's Dream, presumably, in the Naya Marsh Theatre in Christchurch, you were in the bed-sitting room, you were in As You Like It, and you were mm. in The Dragon by Yevgeny Schwartz, in which you played the title role, the dragon, mm. presumably. Posh. Mm. Yeah. Well, any, anything Sam <clears throat> says about the indignities suffered at the hands of Euripides, <laughs> um, <laughs> his one and up one, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, was, uh, I was in a few 
Uh, I was in a few plays at that point. Mm. Um, not, uh, not uh, the dragon. I think yeah, I did play a bigger part, but I, I think in the other ones I played relatively small parts. Mm. But um, I, I was never kind of really going down that road. I, I don't know why I did those things. Probably because somebody asked me. Somebody tell me you were working on a musical now. Uh, I am working on a stage musical. I might say with some adults. Um, who know what they're doing. Um, but uh, it's good fun. It's a it's an adaptation of a very famous Australian children's book called um, Snugglepot and Cuddle Pie. Oh right! And it's a very general sort of musical, like you know, like The Lion King or something, where you need to have a five year old laughing at one sort of joke and a, his parents giggling at something else, and the grandfather getting something that only people who were in the two N Z E F know about. Have you, you know? done a musical before? Uh, not intentionally. No. Um, you got no, a part for a... Sam. Um, I don't know quite... Well, yes, but they're all... Um, I think he'd be Snugglepot. Snugglepot they're all woodland sure. creatures. Who wants to be Snugglepot, he says. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's welcome to... He can be snuggle. I'm sure they'd be delighted. Yeah. If he was... In, if the, if that gets out, we're, we'll get the money for the job. Yeah. I think there's no, got to be... it's good fun. Very good fun. Sam, have you ever written a book? No, no. Well, you've got to take that up. If John can do musicals, you can do book. Oh, John John can do anything, pretty much. I'm, I'm a one-note player. Well, apparently not. Quite right, One and Kim. a half. No, you think, um, yeah, uh, he's got his stuff under a bushel, do you think, John? Yeah, and um, uh, I think Sam can do anything. He, in fact, uh, Sam um, has done, you know, all sorts of things. I've watched Sam's career with a great deal of um, um, pride and admiration, really. In fact, when we did Death in Brunswick, um, I hadn't really done a proper big kind of adult film before, and Sam had been doing them for ages, and I didn't realise how much he'd learnt until we were doing that thing together and we'd be rehearsing and things, and he'd stop in the middle of a scene and I'd say, I'd think he'd forgotten his line, so I'd point to where we were in the script and he said, no, 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 they can't shoot past that point without shifting those lights to over there and moving the camera back around here. And I was like, what on earth is he talking about? Surely our job is to amuse the crew. <laughs> so I'd be going, you know... Oh, and he'd very often say to me just before we did a take, do what you did in take one. Stop playing with it, you know, <laughs> leave it alone. The so, because by, by take four, I was doing it with a, on a pogo stick with a <laughs> Pakistani accent because the crew had stopped giggling. <laughs> I'm pathetic. Oh, I'm so glad you're both having fun. I was just reading some of the stuff about, um, about the books and about Shane Maloney, and it's almost impossible to know whether you guys, and as part of the Australian laconic humour, I imagine, it's impossible to know which is serious and which isn't. Like, the brush-off, it's claimed, won the Ned Kelly Prize for crime fiction. <laughs> it did. You can't tell whether there's a Ned Kelly no, Prize for crime fiction. there is a Ned Kelly Prize for... That's yeah. tragic. Like, that's yeah. the what's it Holt swimming pool thing, It is, it? the Harold mm. Holt Memorial yeah. Swimming Pool. Uh, and also... A fond memory. It mm. tells me Maloney is also the co-author of The Happy Phrase, Everyday Conversation yeah. Made Easily, a self-help book for people wanting to enhance their unintelligibility. Yeah, that's true too. <laughs> <laughs> it is quite true. Is it really? Mm. He's a talented chap, isn't he? He's a, he's a very smart boy. Is Shane. he still writing? Yeah, um, he's, he's still writing. No, but is, is he still writing, Go, uh, you know, I was going to call him... David Wenham books, Murray Whelan yeah, books. Yeah, yeah, he is writing David Wenham books. He's um, he's um, he's got himself. He he goes away and get, you know borrows a beach house or something, and he goes away to you know somewhere and he writes one. And he's got kind of three or four plot lines, and he's got them in his head. He finds the writing rather boring. He needs to go away to do it, or he be, or he's distracted. Mm. But um, yeah, he's still writing, and he's getting better and better. Good. And why don't you both make a proper feature, big screen film of of it, Sam? Mm, you yeah, better ask John that because he's the ideas man. I'm, well, I'm you're just, just the gopher. Yeah, I'm the man who catches the ball and right. goes for a well, run. Well, we, we'd like to. We'd like to put Would it you? that way. Mm. Yeah. No, I, it's a terrifically well. What a it's a wonderful thing to do to work with. You know, very it is very a wonderful talented thing to do. people. But and... I, I wonder how much the concept would need to change if you were making. A feature film, you know, which often is kind of weighed down by its budget mm. and it's more important, like you can be quirkier on the small yeah. screen. I don't know. What do you think? Well, uh, looking at those two films, <laughs> getting back to them again, Number Two and, and Sione's Wedding, mm. which are unpretentious, incredibly relaxed, very charming, but they're feature films. And, and uh, 
I, I really take my hat off to these guys that they, that, they, that they haven't burdened themselves with that terrible kind of thing. I'm going to make a big, significant film. They've just made what comes naturally, and they're just fabulous. Right. So there's a different kind of tone with feature films these days, maybe. It can be. It can be. You yeah. know, I mean, you know, you'll see a film that you think, oh, my God, they, these people have really got the idea that they're making something significant, and, and it's cursed from the beginning. So, Sam, for yourself, like, as, apart from performing a snuggle pot in John Clarke's new musical, That's what are you doing? my ambition. Um, well, I was about to... I just finished a film in Belgium because uh, our little film company doesn't actually employ us, sadly. Hunt away. <laughs> yeah, so we go nice. away and do other things in order to... To bring in... Yeah, in order to make a living. Yes. So I, I've, I've been away making a living in Belgium with a very interesting director called Francois Ozon, and I finished that about a week ago. I've been back picking my grapes, where I have to say Central Tago is enjoying a, a year like no other. And uh, I was about to go to Hungary to do a sort of blood and mud film, First World War, uh, in about a week's time, but I think the whole film has imploded into itself, and that's the thing about films, you never know what's going to happen. Sometimes things get up and sometimes they go down, and oh. it looks like this one's gone down. That's a shame. Which would you rather do, be stuck in a blood and mud trench in Hungary or pick grapes in Central Otago? I think I'd probably go for the grapes, Hard actually. So, you, know, you wouldn't have been to Sam's Vineyard, would you, John? Uh, no, I know where it is, though. Yes, I know. Mm, you, he'll probably send you videos of it. Will you ever overcome this flying thing you've got? Well, it's not. It's travel I don't like. I just don't like, you know, it just seems to me... Well, actually, it's synonymous if we're talking about Melbourne and Sam's Vineyard. It's flying. You're not going to swim there, are you? John doesn't well, like I'm cars not, or trains. You'll yeah. notice I'm not going to Darwin, either. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's nothing personal? No, no, no. I've, I just, no. I've, I've, I've never particularly liked travel. I've got... It's always... It takes a while for me to engineer um, anything longer than a week off. Because well, we'll all the... have to come to Melbourne to see you and the musical.